Hi, and welcome to the Delta MVCD OxyTech Educational Webinar, webinar the sixth in our series. Uh, tonight, we are inviting you to put in your questions. So I want to get that in really early. Please input your questions, and um, we would be very happy to answer them at the end of this webinar. Today's topic is California, mosquitoes, and climate change. What is going on, and uh, why do we have a need for innovative mosquito control technologies in a hotter, wetter world? Our panelists tonight are Dr. Ms. Mustafa Daban, uh, General Manager of Delta Mosquito Vector Control District in Visalia, California. Mustafa, welcome. Thank you. And Dr. Kevin Gorman, CDO of Oxitec. Kevin, glad you could join us. Thanks, Rajiv. It's a pleasure. Fantastic. My name is Rajiv Vidyanathan. I'm Director of US Programs at Oxitec. Um, and we will be jumping right into it. So these webinars uh, for Delta MVCD uh, OxyTech educational webinars are open to everyone. And you might have accessed some of these already on YouTube. Once we're complete here, we will post them publicly online. We encourage you to check them out. Uh, your questions relating to the webinar topic, California, mosquitoes, climate change, will be our first priority. And if we don't get to your question in time, that's okay. Just email us at info at oxytech.com. Our agenda tonight, very broadly, we'll start with the effects of global climate change on human health and then really narrow down on uh, what is that? Uh, what does it look like for mosquitoes? What does it look like for vertebrate reservoirs of disease? So for the birds and mammals that can act as reservoirs of viruses that mosquitoes can transmit. Uh, the impact in California specifically. And then we'll get to your questions. So we'll start. I'm going to make my screen big so I can actually read, right? Uh, the World Health Organization, the WHO, predicts approximately 250,000 more deaths globally per year due to malnutrition, vector-borne disease, and heat stress, and all of those would be consequences of global climate change. There are multiple other impacts, including availability of food and water, uh, and the uh, handling of wastewater, essentially public sanitation. NASA predicts more intense climatic events, and this is something that we have witnessed in our own lifetime. Global climate models predict that hurricanes will cause more intense rainfall. There will be an increased coastal flood risk, and hurricanes that do form are more likely to be severe and damaging. As Fiona uh, off the coast of uh, the Atlantic is uh, demonstrating right now, essentially three uh, million people in Puerto Rico are without power. And we're expecting, we're expecting uh, Fiona to continue to uh, the Dominican Republic. Some places are going to be hotter and wetter. Some places are going to be hotter and drier. And if you are watching this from California, you know exactly what we're talking about. This year alone, the US, much of Northern Europe, India and China experienced some of the hottest temperature on record. Uh, the UK, where Kevin is sitting currently, experienced its hottest uh, temperature in, in over a century. And in the Central Valley of California, where, where Mustafa works, has had over 100 days of daily highs above 100 Fahrenheit. 
In some U.S. cities, this year, the heat has reached such dangerous levels and it's affected millions of Americans. And in many regions, such as California, Oregon, and Washington, uh, Washington State, wildfires are more prevalent and more destructive than they've ever been. What does this change and uh, persistence of temperature, rainfall, have on other species? So we're not even talking about mosquitoes yet. Invasive or non-native species are those, could be animals, could be plants, that are found in a different country or different zone, and they have been introduced into a new area where they don't have natural predators, natural environmental constraints, and so they just really take off. One consequence of longer, hotter, drier, or wetter seasons and higher temperatures is the creation of environments where subtropical or tropical species could flourish. And their range is likely to expand northward as the climate permits year-round establishment. And while that talks about space, in terms of time, we can expect a longer duration of hotter summers. And so not only would you have more of an invasive species moving in a different geographic area, but you'd have a longer duration or persistence of that invasive species. One of the best examples and maybe most dramatic in the US is the invasive Burmese python in the Everglades. This reptile predator is native to uh, South Asia and has uh, really taken off in America's largest wetland, in one of the largest marsh ecosystems uh, in, in North America. In the last 10 years, populations of raccoons, bobcats, rabbits, deer, uh, and um, uh, opossums and raccoons have been reduced by 90%. Essentially, medium-sized mammals have been eliminated from the Everglades because of the uh, persistence and uh, geographic distribution of an invasive species. The Burmese python is probably the most dramatic example we can think of, but the fact is whether it's the lionfish or the Asian carp or zebra mussel, or in California, the star thistle, and in the southeastern U.S., kudzu, invasive species uh, have a greater geographic distribution. They are often very destructive, and because they are not constrained by their native predators and pathogens, can expand uh, and be really destructive in their non-native ecosystems. So now let's focus on mosquitoes. The mosquito species Aedes aegypti is not native to North America or South America, Europe, Asia, or Australia. Aedes aegypti, as all genetic analysis indicates, is most likely native to East Africa. Aedes aegypti was introduced into North and South America about 500 years ago, most likely in water barrels uh, that were carried by Europeans for potable water to the New World. And thus, this mosquito, which lays its eggs on a moist substrate that are then flooded, was brought to North and South America about 500 years ago. Uh, it has spread throughout the United States, as you can see from the map on the right-hand side, uh, and was responsible for yellow fever outbreaks from the 16, 17, and 18 hundreds. Hard as it may be to believe, yellow fever resulted in the deaths of thousands of people in Miami, Charleston, Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, and Boston. And all these cities have something in common. They're all port cities. So every time ships would move from south to north, 
they would carry humans, sailors, with yellow fever and mosquitoes that could transmit the virus. In the 1700s, there, was, uh, there, there were outbreaks, epidemics of yellow fever throughout the east coast of the United States. Aedes aegypti is very well established in the southeastern United States and has been for hundreds of years. Surely it has been introduced west of the Rockies many times, but it only really was established in Arizona and New Mexico in the 1990s. And in Southern California, in about 2012, 2013, probably earlier, although it was not detected, but certainly from 2013, 2014 onward, Aedes aegypti has occupied uh, California as well. So you can see on this map the geographic distribution of this non-native invasive species in the southeastern U.S., southwest U.S., and the Central Valley of California. Why does that matter? When we talk about acceptability or, or the environment itself where Aedes aegypti is found, these are climate zones in the U.S. You can see that climate zones one and three are the primary area where you find Aedes aegypti. So climate zone one is very small. It's essentially southern Florida, uh, and Hawaii is also climate zone one, uh, Puerto Rico, and Guam. Climate zone, climate zone two is the coastal southeastern U.S., and climate zone three is more uh, inland southeastern U.S. into central California. And climate zone two, of course, also includes uh, parts of Arizona and New Mexico. So without a doubt, Aedes aegypti is very well established in zones one through three. However, in the past 10 years, Aedes aegypti has been collected in Washington, D.C., Toronto. Uh, when I lived in Virginia, uh, Aedes aegypti was collected in southern Virginia, sometimes in Suffolk County, in uh, central Virginia near, near Richmond. Uh, Aedes aegypti was detected in Las Vegas in 2017 and in one county in Utah in, um, in 2017. And so while they might not have established themselves in Climate Zone 4, we do expect that with increased heat, uh, with longer durations of summer, and with unexpected and often severe rain events, Aedes aegypti will become established in climate zone four. And since 2013, it has already, think about that, in nine years, established in 23 counties in California. What does that really mean when we talk about geographic and temporal distribution of mosquitoes? Well, mosquitoes are uh, organisms whose body temperature is dependent on the ambient. So if you or I were to go to the North Pole, or if we were to go to the Sahara Desert, our body temperature would still remain at about 98.2. So we maintain a constant body temperature. Mosquitoes' body temperature is a function of the external. So as it gets colder, they slow down. And as it gets hotter, they speed up, up to a point. That means the hotter it gets, the more active is their physiology, um, more generations per season. It also means that any viruses in the mosquitoes will replicate at a higher rate. So add one and one together. You'll have more mosquitoes and the mosquitoes that you do have will have higher numbers of virus in them. Warmer regions will then spread mosquitoes to new geographic areas. And just to really put the cherry on that Sunday, higher rainfall means more habitats 
And those habitats could be something as simple as trash, a wheelbarrow, a bucket, children's toys. Uh, as we see in Aedes aegypti, this species feeds and breeds in and around people's homes. It has a real affinity for human homes and for feeding on people. And female Aedes aegypti, and remember, only female mosquitoes bite male mosquitoes of any species, uh, not just Aedes aegypti. Male mosquitoes don't bite. Only female mosquitoes bite, imbibe blood, and then lay eggs. And the more rainfall uh, and the more uh, prolonged rainfall during the season means that we'll have more natural and artificial temporary habitats for female Aedes aegypti to lay their eggs in. Global climate change also means an effect on the birds and mammals that can act as reservoirs of disease. And reservoir is a term used in epidemiology to refer to an organism that can maintain infectious doses of a virus or another pathogen. And so these reservoirs then um, would have new ranges in which they could expand and thus act as reservoirs for, uh, for, for mosquitoes and other vectors such as ticks. So we've mentioned many birds and mammals are important reservoirs for mosquito-borne viruses. The best example that we know of in North America is West Nile virus, for which birds are reservoirs. Uh, and the same is true for a lot of other North American viruses, such as uh, St. Louis encephalitis or Eastern equine encephalitis and the other equine encephalitis viruses. Also true for uh, deer and squirrels, chipmunks, and other mammals that can act as reservoirs for these viruses and other pathogens. The truth is, we don't know what effect climate change will have on individual susceptibility to infection and the population health of these animals. We do know that climate change, deforestation, uh, and the use uh, or introduction of uh, animals into ranges to which they are not native uh, can lead to what are called zoonotic diseases. And zoonotic means found in animals. Zoonotic diseases are the best source of crossing over infections to humans. West Nile virus is a zoonotic disease. Lyme disease is a zoonotic disease. All this talk about mosquitoes and about animals, we'll talk about the one animal that we really care about the most, human populations and Aedes aegypti. Aedes aegypti is probably the most urban mosquito on the planet. It has evolved intimately with human behavior uh, human periodicity during the day, uh, human settlements, and even human water use. Uh, Aedes aegypti feeds almost exclusively on people, and the greatest population density of people are in cities. And so as global climate change affects farmland, creates droughts or floods, and pushes human populations outside of traditional agricultural areas to cities where hopefully there's more opportunity. It also results in an influx of viruses never seen before and unhygienic conditions, which are great for breeding Aedes aegypti. And so increased urbanization for so many reasons can result in greater mosquito populations and greater transmission of mosquito-borne disease. At this point, I'm going to defer from that background of global climate change, animals, mosquitoes, and specifically Kevin is going to talk about uh, Aedes aegypti in California, and I'll mute myself. Well, thanks, Rajiv. Uh 
appreciate it. Uh, just a quick reminder to everybody to get your questions in if you've got them. Remember, you can throw them into the chat bar so that you don't need to wait until the end. Um, the sooner we get the questions, the sooner we, we know that uh, we can uh, pass them on to you. Um, okay, uh, those questions are anonymous as well. I would just add so that you, you don't need to worry that uh, your name will be given out with a question. All questions remain anonymous. Uh, so thank you, Rajiv. Uh, just a couple of slides here on um, Aedes aegypti uh, and locally, you know, in California. Um, it is, uh, uh, as Rajiv said, a very invasive species. Uh, it's not just in the US where it's invasive. It's, it's all around the world in the subtropics and the, and the tropics. And California being right on the edge of its host range, uh, it has become susceptible to established populations of Aedes aegypti in the last 10 years or so. Uh, this slide shows, um, you know, it was first uh, introduced uh, and established from 2013 or known to be. Uh, Fresno uh, was one of the first, um, San Mateo and Madeira. Um, since then, in the last 10 years, uh, it's it's run amok, uh, to be honest, in, in California and has spread now to 23 different counties. Um, <clears throat> It's a pretty incredible turnaround and, um, and and from those early days when it was first detected and, uh, you know, thinking about whether it could be, made, you know, controlled or or maintained in a particular locality or would it spread? Well, it certainly spread, as you can see from the map. Uh, you've got uh, red dots on that map pre representing uh, confirmed establishments of Aedes aegypti. But you'll also see uh, blue dots as well for Aedes albopictus. Aedes albopictus is a is a sometimes coexisting species. Uh, it overlaps with Aedes aegypti in certain environments. It's more rural uh, than, than Aedes aegypti, not quite as associated with humans, uh, but it is a similar a mosquito from the same genus. And, uh, and as such, it, it, it also has the ability to transmit uh, a range of viruses that Aedes aegypti uh, is typically the primary vector for. Um, but that means that essentially there's, you know, there's two good vectors here for, for some of the diseases within California uh, that are present and they're right the way through the season. Um, with that invasiveness comes that persistence that, that Rajiv was talking about uh, in California. Um, you know, it varies the seasonality depending on where you are in California, but it's typically about May to November for these Aedes, Aedes species. So that's, you know, that, that's a significant part of the year, six months of the year where people are at risk of being bitten by one of these mosquitoes. Um, that season might extend. Uh, it's a little bit longer in some other areas of the US uh, currently. And so, you know, that, that might extend if climate uh, warming continues. But it's a pretty big window as it stands. And uh, given the fact that diseases are, you know, being transported through um, travel related uh, illnesses each well most years uh, in California there are cases where people who have acquired a dengue or, or, or other Aedes born disease uh, are over abroad you know when they're on holiday for example they bring it back and then they uh, there's the potential for them to get bitten by a local uh, Aedes aegypti or Aedes albopictus and then for that disease to be uh, transmitted locally not the case so far thankfully uh, no locally transmitted uh, cases um, so that's good news of course uh, but it's not something that we want to hang around and wait for and uh, and uh, really appreciative to Mustafa for joining again as normal uh, but um, he'll be ready to answer questions uh, in the Q&A uh, relating to these particular uh, these particular examples um, so it spread, uh, it spread pretty quickly. Uh, and, you know, why is it that we can't control it? Because it's a difficult beast to control. Uh, it's in and around people's homes. It makes it difficult to access those homes, to control the mosquitoes. Uh, and, and not only that, it, 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 it is very adept at uh, laying its eggs in very small breeding sites. As Rajiv mentioned before, these, you know, these can be as, as small as a bottle top. Uh, in, a, in a pile of rubbish. Very, very difficult to get rid of these breeding sites. It's not as if you can just go around and, uh, and, and, and successfully tip and toss every single one. Some of them are in trees, in the bowls of plants. Um, it's, it's, it's a very difficult um, scenario when it comes to the breeding site management for this particular pest. It's got a daytime 
uh, biting behavior or activity profile, uh, slightly different than some other mosquitoes. Um, and, you know, that means that, it, it, again, um, you can't put bed nets out or something like that and prevent yourself getting bitten at night necessarily. These are things that are flying around, biting at your legs under the dinner table when you're out at the restaurant in the early evening. A real big problem has been the development of insecticide resistance. Um, this is particularly uh, a concern for Aedes aegypti and has been on the rise. Uh, the more we use insecticides, the more resistance has got the potential to develop. Um, it's a selection pressure thing. The more you use it, the more you, the more resistance you get. Uh, and in this particular species, adults particularly have developed resistance to a number of insecticide classes that are commonly used against them. Um, that means that the tools that we have, that, that Mustafa has, for example, to fight these, these insects uh, are not working as well as they used to. Um, there isn't an ever ending, an ever ending, a never ending conveyor belt of insecticidal chemistries. Uh, unfortunately, that's not the case. They're very expensive to develop. They're very difficult to register. And, um, and those active ingredients, you know, uh, there isn't an, uh, an unending supply of new actives that counter that resistance development. So new tools are needed. Uh, and that's, uh, uh, and that really is shown by, by one of the next slides. Uh, this one shows you that, you know, uh, 11 districts uh, in California uh, have wanted to work with Oxitec with, uh, to look at our new tool and to look at the, um, the ability of that uh, male mosquito that we can release to control these wild pest Aedes aegypti. Um, those, dis those districts in, in, in count are in counties that span the whole state pretty much, as you can see from the map there. Um, it's, uh, it, these counties signed up to our EUP formally uh, and were interested in a project. Uh, we were extremely thankful and, and really pleased with the interest, of course, um, and very grateful to each and every one of those uh, uh, for, uh, for their interest. Um, and over the selection period, uh, to understand where we would like to actually go, of course, we've landed with Delta and Mustafa as, as our primary partner for, for a range of reasons. Uh, our federal uh, EUP application was approved uh, in earlier uh, in the year, and uh, now we have a, an application under review at the state level in California with uh, California Department of Pesticide Regulation. Uh, and it's not until that uh, approval at the state level uh, is granted that we could ever carry out the project in California. Uh, but it is something that we're hoping will come through in the, you know, in the coming months. Um, this slide really just shows, uh, you know, what I alluded to earlier. There isn't any locally uh, um, transmitted cases of Aedes borne virus diseases in, in California at the moment, and, and, and that's great news. But there are travel-related cases that come in, and, and, and that just demonstrates the potential uh, or, the, or the risk. There are other areas in the U.S. where, where locally acquired cases do happen most years, um, uh, down south in Florida being one of those, um, but there are also others too. Uh, of course, uh, Zika ran through certain areas um, back in 2015, 16, and a little bit of 17. Um, but because of its daytime uh, habits as well, this mosqu particular mosquito is a, is a nuisance biter. And um, I'm sure as Mustafa will, 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 will confirm, you know, it really is a, a one of the top reasons that people call MCDs uh, mosquito control districts in the US, in California, um, because it is a nuisance biter as well as, uh, you know, a potential um, disease threat. So uh, just a, a quick recap here, just a single slide on the mosquito. So you know, just to recap and maybe prompt a question or two, um, on our mosquito. Uh, we don't use an insecticide uh, to control uh, this mosquito. We use the mosquito itself. Uh, the mosquito carries a couple of genes that we've uh, integrated. One of them is a marker gene that allows us to track and trace uh, the insects, these male insects that we release. And one of them is a what we call a self-limiting gene. It just produces a benign protein that kills all the female offspring at a very early stage.
So we can release our male only insects, our male only Aedes aegypti, uh, which don't bite and therefore don't um, contribute to disease transmission. And they'll go out and search for those wild females, mate with them, and those wild females will only lay viable male offspring. Of all their eggs, all the female offspring will die at a very young stage and not go through to adulthood. And then when we keep releasing, we reduce the females out of the population and that reduces the population as a whole and we get population suppression relatively quickly, uh, well within a season typically. <clears throat> um, it's a biological control tool. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's not as prone to resistance development, for example. Um, it's, um, it's safe, it's non-toxic, non there's no allergen in there. Um, and it's proven effective in a variety of countries around the world. Um, so it, it is a, um, you know, a slightly new way of, uh, of looking at controlling this particular species, you might say, but it's also a very sustainable way and one that could give us very long term, good long term effectiveness, um, uh, you know, without any um, impacts on the environment. So a great unique combination of characteristics and, uh, and that really makes it a, a, a unique product. So um, subject to, D uh, to Cal DPR or California Department of Pesticide Regulation approval, um, we could uh, have the ability to do a project in California and in Visalia um, sometime next year, hopefully. Okay, Rajiv, I shall hand back to you and um, we can do question and answers, I think. Thank you, Kevin. I just unmuted myself. I'm going to jump into the questions. Um, Mustafa, can you hear us okay? Yes, I can hear you. Thank well, you. Great. Thank you. Um, first question, how does Delta, it should be Delta MVCD, it's not just Delta, but how does Delta MVCD control this mosquito now? That That's a great question. And the way we do it right now is... Uh, using integrated, of course, using integrated mosquito management. And what that means, we use some pesticides. You know, we use whether adulticides or larvicides. We call them wide area larvicides. And we also, believe it or not, we use the, the term education and outreach where we go out to the community and we're trying to explain to the community that they can help us help themselves protect this mosquito by removing the containers and removing anything that it breeds on. Because as you said earlier, this mosquito li lives among people, like in the backyard, the front yard, whether in a tire, whether in a, in a bucket or even a plant and so forth. So, so we do a, a, a conglomerate and integrated methods, you know, and of course, we're also looking forward to using Oxitec, which will be another tool that we will add to it to see how we can manage this mosquito. So there are a lot of different ways, but we can't just go after it with the pesticide because as you know, pesticides have, you know, this mosquito has developed resistance to it. So we try to rotate using also biological insecticide to go after it. So the combination of uh, some insecticides, some education outreach and also larvicide. So we do all what we can to manage it and I'm looking forward in the future to use this novel technique by Oxitec to help us manage this uh, very difficult mosquito to manage. You know what? That's a really good segue. Uh, full disclosure, Mustafa does not see the questions, but he predicted the next question anyway. Uh, and that is, if you use this technology, does that mean you can stop spraying? Well, I would hope so, but no. I mean, uh, what what can what would we don't know yet because if this technology proves to be, you know, a panacea or something that uh, can, of course, minimize the problem and help us with managing the Aedes aegypti, which is a yellow fever mosquito, yes. But you know, one tool does not always work. You know, we want to use, as I said, I will always use all. You know, all tools available to me, whether they are a biological or whether it's a novel technique or whether it's a pesticide, whether it's education outreach and so forth. Because historically, this 
mosquito is the most difficult mosquito to manage in the entire world, not just in Visalia or in the uh, Central Valley of California or California. So we, yeah, I mean, we would we would definitely look forward to using this technique. And if it does work, we will just add it to the armaments that we have, because this mosquito you gotta hit it with all what you, what you have and what you can. And I hope this will be a good tool that that you know that we're predicting that it might be something that the EPA in the future can register and we could be we could be using it. Yes, definitely. Thank you, Mustafa. Um, the next question is one that that I have been asked when knocking on doors, and so I'd I'd like to take this because I know it's on people's minds. I also love where this question is coming from, and that is, if you eliminate the mosquito, won't that result in the extinction of the birds and the frogs and other things that feed on it? And and I think that's a very thoughtful question because you're concerned about ecology. Uh, a little. A little bit just to step back, there are thousands and thousands of species of mosquitoes. There are 3,500 known species. And yes, absolutely, there are important native species that are abundant as larvae. And so they are important sources of nutrition for frogs and fish and aquatic insects. And when they emerge as adults, they are... Uh, they are a source of nutrition for, for birds, for spiders, uh, for frogs. So yes, absolutely. Native salt marsh mosquitoes, uh, Culex tarsalis, Culex nigropalpus, Aedes taenurhynchus. These are pestiferous, but they are also important sources of biomass for aquatic and aerial predators. Let's establish that. We're talking about Aedes aegypti, which, if you've been paying attention, is a non-native invasive species that breeds in temporary habitats around people's homes. So wheelbarrows, jet skis, and buckets are not where you're going to find frogs and uh, aquatic insects. So the larvae are not an important source of nutrition for aquatic predators. At the same time, the adult emergence is scant and asynchronous. That means, in other words, there are never very many of them, and it's hard to predict when they come out. So because Aedes aegypti adults tend to be scant, and because they're in and around people's homes, the adults are not an important source of nutrition for aerial predators. And so while the question itself well, if you eliminate the mosquito, you know, what are the other effects in the, in the food web? That's a good question, and it's thoughtful. And it matters when we're talking about the huge biomass of native North American mosquitoes. However, Aedes aegypti is a non-native invasive species, and both larvae and adults are not significant sources of nutrition for native predators. A question for Mustafa. I think there's a little misunderstanding here, so here's an opportunity to clear it up. Mustafa, didn't you already try this in Fresno? No, I didn't. No, we did not try. Uh, we, did, we did not try this one. There was a, a different technique similar to this, and it was tried by uh, by a consolidated mosquito abatement in Clovis. What they did is that they used another technique, a novel, a no, another novel technique that uses Wolbachia. Wolbachia is bacteria, where bacteria is inserted in a male mosquito, and that male mosquito goes and finds a female mosquito, and they mate, and that would would end up killing the mosquito larvae, the baby mosquitoes. So it was a similar, but it's not the same technique. It was done by the mosquito mate which they own the comp the the they, they own bacteria that they use which is called Wolbachia. This is a similar technique, but it uses the Oxitec uses self-limiting gene. So it's not like uh, the, the the Wolbachia that's inserted, it's a pro, uh, bacteria that's inserted in a male mosquito. They're similar techniques, but they 
they use different mechanisms. One uses a self-limiting gene and the other one uses a bacteria. So no, we didn't use that uh, practice. So. I've heard that question before. People have asked me as well. Haven't you already done this? No, no. And, and if I may add to that, uh, Mustafa, there is no way that we could have done this. We are waiting to hear from California yeah. Department of Pesticide Regulation. Um, Oxitec has not run any projects in, in California. Uh, we have been uh, evaluating in Florida uh, since essentially April of last year. So for, for about two years, we have been in Florida. And uh, Kevin, I'd like you to, to take the next question, which is, how's the project in Florida? <laughs> Very generic. How's the project in Florida? <laughs> maybe, maybe narrow down. What are, what are we seeing? What can you share? Sure, sure, sure. Nice no, no segue. Uh, project's going great. Uh, we had a uh, season last year, 2021, uh, um, first project. Uh, in, in the US for us with Aedes aegypti uh, uh, being released into the environment. Uh, we've, it's, a, it's a regulated trial. Uh, we've got replicated areas where we're looking at uh, neighborhood type uh, effects as well as single household effects. Uh, so where we're releasing just at one property. Um, and then we've replicated that in 2022 and it's gone great so far. Uh, we've had a lot of successes with, with We've learned a little bit about uh, the mosquitoes in that particular environment, um, finding out that they behave pretty much like our mosquitoes do in, in, in the other environments too. Um, they're dispersing well, they're mating well, um, and um, you know they're reducing the number of females out there. Um, so, so all very encouraging. Uh, we will be completing this season. Uh, we may um, you know, look to do, continue something next year potentially but at the moment we're completing this season and uh in due course we'll submit that data to the regulators and the regulators will take it into account when they come to a section three um application from us uh, to see if we can get commercial approval uh, in the long run so you know uh, we need uh, a, a good varied data set for the epa uh, with good replication and that's exactly what uh, florida is providing thank you kevin and uh, just maybe to call back to that climate zone map, all the data we have to date is for climate zone one, right? It's all in Southern Florida, uh, and it's it's hard to extrapolate what that might mean to, to say the arid environment of New Mexico, Nevada, um, Arizona, and Central California. And so there's value in evaluating this same technology in a very different environment. So, so we can make some, some claims that are at parity for uh, climate zone one and climate zone three. Hence the, the interest in working in, uh, in central California. Uh, segue to Mustafa. Uh, you said that there is no locally transmitted dengue in Tulare County. Then why bring this technology? That, that's a great question. Why bring it is that, why wait until you have a problem? Why wait until you have a disease when you can do your best to prevent it before it happens? We are in the prevention business. Once we have a local transmission, it will be a lot harder to also manage the problem because now the problem is already distributed. It's, it's transmitted, it's already there. So the goal, my goal, is to keep it from, you know, to prevent this disease from, from, from happening, to try and keep managing this mosquito as much as we can so we can almost, you know, block it and from getting the, the virus so we can transmit a dengue disease. So I can see somebody can, yeah, it's a, can, can say, well, why you don't have a problem? Why are you doing? Well, my philosophy is that why wait until you have a problem? I mean, the, the, the biggest solution would be to prevent it before it happens. Once it happens, it's, it's, it's too bad. It will be too much more difficult to manage and it will cost so much more because then we'll have people having, you know, being sick, you know, people can die from dengue and so forth. So it's better to prevent it before it, I mean, if, of course, God forbid, you know, if it does happen, then we'll still have to, to do what we got to do to control. But 
my best policy is to prevent it before it happens. That that sounds like your job description. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, Kevin, I'm going to take that. Uh, can I buy this and try it at home? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. That's, that's the, unfortunately not if you're in the U.S. You can if you're in Brazil. Uh, uh, so uh, we have commercial approval for this particular um, ADC Jeep in Brazil. And so you can order it online in Brazil, get it sent to your house, and you can put it in your backyard and, uh, and protect yourselves and your family. Um, not in the US though at the moment. And that's part of you know the EUPs, these experimental use permits as, as, as they're fondly known, um, are designed to generate data on US soil that can be given to the regulators and contribute to a, an application for a commercial approval in the US. Um, so um, of course they provide a great demonstration of a product, but you know, a, a, they're in essence, you know, a way of demonstrating to the regulators that a technology or a product is safe and efficacious. And so that's the that, that's the overarching goal, uh, if you like, is to get this kind of product uh, available to people in the US who might want to use it. Uh, in the long run, you know, we expect that household, households, homeowners can purchase this product potentially, you know, uh, in, in, a, in a retail store or online. Um, but we're working with um, mosquito control districts uh, such as Mustafa's, uh, you, you know, to really get this product demonstrated and, uh, and and get that approval as quick as possible, so we can get it into people's hands. Mustafa, would you like to add to that? Are you good? Well, absolutely. You know, I mean, that's uh, what we're here for. You know, I mean, we we definitely will do anything we can to protect uh, not only. Uh, our district, but humanity in general. We want to protect people from getting not only bitten by mosquitoes, but uh, the mosquito-borne diseases. That's that's our that's my biggest goal, and that is to prevent people from getting bitten and also getting the the mosquito-borne disease. So this is for both of you. Um, I might defer to Kevin first, uh, and that is. When are you going to roll out this project in California? Um, when uh, is when we get um, approval from the state? You know that that that's a prerequisite uh, to our project, um, uh, as is federal approval, which we already have. So th that's the. Um, what you might say is the rate limiting step at the moment, I guess, uh, is is ensuring that we have full regulatory approval. Once we have that, uh, we have a strong partner in Mustafa and team. And, uh, you know, we're, 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 we've set up in this area. We're, we are pretty much ready to go. Um, but of course, uh, it requires uh, state approval. And, you know, um, California Department of Pesticide Regulation uh, you know, need time to actually make that right, make that make that decision. Consider all the variable, all all the factors that they have to, and uh, and, and produce that decision. So we can't rush them. Uh, we give them, you know, uh, we're, we're um, absolutely respectful of the time that they need to make those decisions. Um, but of course, um, you know, um, our timeline, you know, is optimistically looking at 2023 for a project. Um, you know, but but as I say, we. we we are. We can't do anything without that that state that state regulation, that state approval uh, to do the project. But twenty twenty three would be our would, would be our win. I, Mustafa. I, yes, uh, I agree with Kevin, and I think that's a great question to ask California Department of Pesticide Regulation Office. You know, you guys, if you have this question. I think Kevin and I cannot really answer it. All we can say is that we are waiting the approval from California Department of Pesticide Regulation. If you would really want to know for sure, contact the California Department of Pesticide Regulation office and ask them the same question because that's that's that would be the legitimate office to answer that question, not Kevin or myself, because we're ready. We're ready to help you. We're ready to take care of you. We're ready to do what we can do, but we cannot do it until a regulatory office gives the approval 
to do the, the field trial. So please, yes, if you have that concern, you have that question, and uh, the best officer answer for you, it will be California Department of Pesticide Regulation Office. Thank you. Thanks. And um, I have a, a quick question here that I can answer before going back to you, and that is, how can I sign up? How can I learn more? Well, first of all, if you have any other questions, you can always submit them to info at oxytech.com, and that's specifically for the webinar, or if you have any other questions as well. Um, if you are interested in um, uh, signing up, you can go to oxytech.com forward slash California or californiamosquitoproject.com, and you'll learn about uh, the collaboration with Delta, MVCD, and Oxytech. Uh, fact is, you know, if you are interested in, in hosting a box, when we do get a permit from the California DPR, uh, sign up. We'd love to, to have more. So uh, yeah, you can sign up online. You can email us. Thank you. Now back to both of you. And I think the next question really is for Mustafa. It's, uh, it's a, a very relevant for, for California. Trying to word it. Why has this species spread through California now? Why now? What happened? Well, that's a great question, a very uh, scientific question. There's a lot of factors. Uh, it could be definitely, I would spe specifically talk to the climate change, okay? Climate change has really moved, you know, the whether it's Aedes albopictus, which is the, the Asian tiger mosquito, or the yellow fever mosquito, Aedes aegypti. As Kevin said, mentioned earlier, within nine to 10 years, this Aedes aegypti, the yellow fever mosquito, has spread, you know, all over, all through California into 23 counties. And co we're counting more. I think by next uh, year, by next mosquito season, there'll probably be another county that might have it. So it's just, you know, the weather, the, you know, the, the other ecological factors, and it's uh, people uh, moving into uh, cities, urbanization, you know, uh, people having a lot of uh, whether tires or they're having a habitat. We are creating a habitat for this mosquito, whether it's uh, a tire, as I said earlier, or a plant, planter, you know, like a pail or, uh, uh, or like any container that holds mosquitoes because they breed in very small amounts of water. They don't need a large amount of water. So earlier it was, it was mentioned that even a, a cup of a bottle if it has water in it, the the female Aedes aegypti, yellow fever mosquito will come by and, you know, definitely lay eggs. And because the weather is so hot, within three to four days, it can go from an egg to an adult state. So there's a lot of ecological factors, but I also think the human behavior and also the climate change. Those are the things that are making it more of a problem. Yeah, I mean Maybe I just add to that a little bit, if that's all right, Mustafa. Um, you know that it's not just California where it's where it's invading. You know, uh, in Europe, it's becoming more northerly year on year, for example. You know, and again, you know, the thought is that it's it's down to climate warming, as as Mustafa has alluded to. Um, of course, urbanization, transport, and travel and trade, um, uh, you know, all contribute. But it's it's not as if it's you know invaded California. You know, as uh, as a unique case it's invading everywhere it can it's pushing the boundaries of its host range um you know more and more and um and california just happens to be right on the edge of that of that host range and as um is is one of the dynamic spots that uh, around the world of which there are quite a few thank you kevin uh, we have about five or six minutes left and here's here's a nice biology question right uh you're talking about mosquito season where do mosquitoes go in the winter? Mustafa, would you like to start with that? Where oh, yes. I, I, First of all, you know, they, you can use the word estivate, you know, which means like sometimes they just like a similar to a hibernate, okay? And they can be just hanging there until, 
you know, the, because the weather gets so cold to the point where they can't move. They they cannot really survive in a very cold climate. They, their t uh, temperature would be above, six, you know, 60 and above. Once it gets getting cooler than that, some of them, you know, you might think, you know, they're not there, but they are around. They're just not active as much. And they don't, you know, seek areas to lay eggs and reproduce because the... That just the environment is not warm enough, you know, hot enough for them to be able to be active. That doesn't mean they all disappear, you know. They are hiding somewhere, and you might even see sometimes if the weather gets like in the high 80s or 70s during the winter, you could probably see some mosquitoes uh, flying around. So it's a it's a matter of the the environment, the temperature. Really, go ahead and I add to it, uh, Rajiv. I would just clarify, when we talk about Aedes aegypti, and there's one more question I do want to get to. Um, when we talk about Aedes aegypti, all Aedes mosquitoes overwinter as eggs, right? So females lay eggs, and then it's the egg stage that remains dormant until there's rain or irrigation. Other mosquito species, such as Culex or Anopheles, overwinter as adults. So it's a, a very different uh, mechanism of responding to unfavorable conditions. In the case of 80s, females lay eggs, females die. And then the eggs uh, survive during a difficult period. In the case of Culex and Anopheles, they overwinter as adults, they kind of bulk up, they get some fat. And then when the conditions are, are better, uh, then, then they can lay eggs. So I do wanna to get to this. This is from one of our, uh, our last questions. Are the box hosts limited to Delta MVCD boundaries or just to Tulare County in general? Um, well, I, I, I can answer it, Kevin. Yeah, go, go for it. Say, you could, yeah. Um, so, so, you know, we're working with, with Mustafa, you know, and when it comes to uh, the project areas, you know, we're focusing, you know, primarily on Visalia. Um, in theory, you know, we can release anywhere in Tulare County, uh, according to EPA, uh, and hopefully subject to DPS, Cal DPR's approval, uh, you know, we'd, you know, that would, that would hold. Um, but our project sites are, uh, are preferentially going to be in Visalia. And so, uh, you know, as opposed to elsewhere in the county. Mustafa, feel free to, 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 to supplement. Yes, uh, well, the project will be in Visalia, where the establishment of Aedes aegypti is, and we've asked, you know, architect asked to do a, pro a field project here the, in, in, the, in, the, in our district, and uh, looking at the data, Visalia has the most, you know, right, right now areas where the establishment of Aedes aegypti is, so we will provide Oxitec with the, the areas where the establishment of Aedes aegypti is the best and the most, because that's where you want to do the study. And so that's why we're going to be doing it. doesn't mean we can't do it anywhere, anywhere else, but it's, it's not a, you know, EPA gives you only a certain area where you can do the study. You're not going to go the entire county, you know, and we also... We, you know, the, the EUP, the experimental uh, unit uh, uh, permit is given to us to do where the data is going to be, shows where the Aedes aegypti is the majority is. And that's where we're going to be doing it. So you can't just go and do it everywhere you can. But then again, uh, Tulare County is so huge, you know, you want, you know, not only you know, target the area where you can best, where we best see. We know that because we, we trap, you know, Aedes aegypti every summer. So we know where the problems are and the, the problematic areas. And that's where we want to do the, the collaborative trials so that we can see, we can also gather enough data to show if it works or if it doesn't. So you can go to EPA to ask for permission to register and also approve the products if you want to use it. You don't want to go to some areas where Aedes aegypti is not there. You want to go to areas where we know it's established and there's a population there to do the test. I, I refer to uh, Delta MVCD as the Goldilocks area. 
not too big, not too small, uh, and you have a lot of 80s Egypti. Yeah. So um, we are coming up on the hour. I want to thank uh, Mustafa Deban and Kevin Gorman uh, for, for answering questions and for supporting us tonight. As we mentioned earlier, and I'm going to repeat myself, we are going to post this online. So please check out the YouTube uh, channel. And uh, if you have any questions that we did not get to, please send it to us at info at oxytech.com. Mustafa, Kevin, thank you so much.